It's a great time of worship today. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. We're in the midst of a series called Future Family. If you missed the first two weeks, I want to encourage you to go on our website and listen to those. It'll be really good for you to catch those. But today what I want to talk about um, is what kind of an impact are you having with your kids, your grandkids, nieces, nephews, siblings, whatever. I I want you to know this this morning. Uh, This series called Future Family um, is a parenting series, but it's so much more than that. So um, as we talk about this and continue on in this series, if you're empty nesters, if you uh, don't have any kids or anything like that, it's easy to kind of check out, but I want you to know this morning, throughout their series, there's many, many principles and things that we're going to cover in God's Word that applies to every single person in here today, whether you're a teenager, all the way up to having no kids in your home anymore. All these things that we talk about apply in one way or another. But before we jump into this morning, can you do me a favor and just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? And I just want to take a moment, just, I, I just want to have you take a moment to ask God to speak to you today, okay? Um, Just to give him permission um, to speak to you in whatever he has for you this morning. To give him permission to convict you, to direct you, to encourage you, whatever it may be that you need. Man, I tell you what, Sundays can be so distracting. Uh, We can come in grumpy, we can come in distracted or um, just in bad moods or whatever it may be. Just a lot on your mind, a lot on your heart. Now's the time to release that to the Lord and allow him to speak to you. Um, so just give him a moment and just, and just tell him, God, just, I, I give you this time to speak, lead, guide, and direct in my life. God, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word, and I pray, Lord, that you will uh, just speak through me. God, I pray that your words, not mine. And as we go through this, Lord, that your spirit will just open our hearts and minds to some things that you'd want us to catch so that we can leave different today. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for your many blessings in our life, and we pray all these things in your name, amen. So the title of my message today is Impacting the Next Generation, and I want you to know um, that as I go into this, it's going to be a little bit different of a message, because I really got one key thought that I want you to walk away with, okay? Make it really simple and easy. I got one key thing that I want all of you, and myself included, to walk away with today. And so when we're talking about impacting the next generation, I want you to understand that when we talk about impacting, we're not just talking about impacting your kids. We're talking about impact, making an impact and having an influence that stretches way beyond just our kids, but into the next generation of kids. So even if you're a teenager, I'm talking about the way you live today, setting yourself up for what's in the future, um, that you're going to make decisions that's going to impact the next generation, okay? And if you're here and you got kids or you got grandkids, I want to talk about you living in such a way that leaves an impact and an influence that stretches far beyond that to generations to come that you may never get an opportunity to meet. Maybe it's even with your nieces or your nephews or whatever the case may be. I want you to look at this message and think about what, how does this apply to you? Because we're talking about an impact and an influence that stretches to generations to come by the life you live right now. So here's the key thought that I want you to get, all right? We're going to kick it off with this key thought. The one thing I want you to walk away with, everything we talk about is going to tie to this, and that key thought is this, is that you will be a snapshot of a future generation. You will be a snapshot of a future generation. Let me give an example of this. Um, My grandma passed away uh, a long time ago, and so my kids never really got an opportunity to do a lot of life with their great-grandma, but they got a little bit of experience. Um, But, man, she's had a great impact in my life, and she's had an impact even in my family's life, whether my kids realize it or not. One thing that she was really big on is, is having family time together. As a matter of fact, before Tara and I, my wife, got married, Um, my wife sat down with her and said, hey, man, if if you got any, she didn't say, hey, man. She said, hey. You got anything, any advice that you could give me, what would it be? And my grandma said this. She said, do everything together. Do everything together. Even if you're grocery shopping, do it together. Do everything together. And so that really rang true. And uh, we, we apply that. And so Our family does everything together. We value our family time. We love spending time together. And hopefully as our kids get older and become teenagers, that's still going to be the case, okay? Um, But we love to be together and do things as a family. We're that way because my parents were that way. My parents were that way because their parents were that way. 
And so because of that, it's had this generational effect, right? And so that advice we really took to heart. And so our kids hear us say that all the time. We like to do things together. We want to do things together. And so even my older two had a little bit of an opportunity to spend time with their great-grandma. And when we did that, we spent time together. It was in her backyard or it was doing one of her favorite things. Bingo. How many guys do bingo? Anybody? It's awful, okay? It's no fun at all. But she enjoyed it. So we did it all together, right? And we just had fun doing that together. And so because of that value, um, I know this, that, that it's been passed down to us and we value our family time and our kids know that we value our family time and that's going to influence them when they have kids that they're going to value their family time because that's what they saw growing up. And it's all because of my grandma passing that down. She is a snapshot of a future generation, a value that she had made an impact for generations to come of people that she will never, ever meet. But that one simple thing has made an impact. And I want to pull from a story, which we see this illustrated really well from Scripture. And it's in the Old Testament. We're going to look at a family in the Old Testament. So if you're here today and you ever say like, man, I just want my family to be like the families in the Old Testament. If that's the case, then it's safe to say your family would be pretty jacked up because there's no good family in the Old Testament. They're all kind of messed up, but there's some things we can definitely pull from. And so we're going to look at a family in Genesis chapter 39 that really shows the power of impacting the next generation by simple things that you do. So we're going to kind of jump around a little bit in Genesis. And so we're going to look at um, a story that's pretty famous, pretty well-known story. Um, but it all starts with this lineage. It's a family tree kind of, if you will. So we're going to put a picture up here, and we're going to show this. Um, this is what we're going to talk about, this family, if we can put that up here, if we got it. All right, so this is kind of the family tree. It starts with Abraham. Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob and Esau, who were twins, but Esau was born a little bit before Jacob. And then Jacob had 12 sons, and the most famous son, of course, is Joseph. And so we're going to talk about his story just a little bit. When Joseph... And again, this is a story that many of you know, but when Joseph was 17 years old, he kind of got the picture and found out that his brothers hated him, okay? His brothers hated him, and they hated him because um, he was his father's favorite son, because he was born of his father's favorite wife, okay? And because that was their, his child from his favorite wife, he became his favorite son. So he valued him more than the rest, and so it was very evident and clear that this was his favorite son. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, and so his brothers hated him. And so what Jacob would often do is have Joseph kind of check on his brothers because his brothers were always getting into trouble, and so he'd always have Joseph go check on his other brothers, and so Joseph would go check on them, see that they're getting in trouble, come back to his dad and say, Dad, you won't believe what they're doing this time, and he'd tell them, and they'd get in trouble. So this one time, Jacob says, Joseph, I want you to go check on your brothers, so he goes and he finds them. Of course, they're doing their own thing, not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and so this time, the brothers see Joseph coming, and they're like, man, I'm done with this. I'm tired of this guy. Let's, let's, get, let's do something to get rid of it, because here comes Joseph, the tattletale, dad's favorite. Man, we just need to be done dealing with him. So they came up with this plan that they wanted to kill him. So what they did was they grabbed Joseph, and they threw him in a well, in this big well, in a pit. And they threw him in there, and as they left him in there, they kind of started to feel guilty a little bit. And they decided, hey, you know what, let's not kill him. Let's do this. We're going to rip off his robe, and what we're going to do with that is we're going to put some blood on it, and then we're going to tell Dad that he died, and let's just sell him off as a slave. So we won't kill him, let's just sell him off. So they sell Joseph off to some slave traders and then they take his coat which was very precious to him and his dad they put some blood on it they take it back to dad and said dad here's joseph's robe something happened i don't know there's blood on it it must have been a terrible fight but we just want to let you know that your favorite son is dead he's dead and so now joseph is being taken to egypt to become a slave and joseph becomes a slave to a man named potiphar who was a captain in Pharaoh's army, so he went into Potiphar's house. And as Joseph goes into Potiphar's house as a slave, um, this is our, our really a first powerful point that we can get when it comes to impacting the next generation. And that's this if you're writing, it down, you're writing the notes. The greatest impact is often made in the midst of hard situations. We see this in Joseph's life that the greatest impact is often made in hard situations. Joseph is is 
stabbed in the back and betrayed by his own brothers, and now he's a slave. That's a pretty bad place to be. It's a hard situation. You know, that life is really 10% what happens to you, but 90% how you respond. Life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you respond. Life's tough. Life's hard. No matter what age you are, difficult things happen. But it's how you respond in the midst of those times, even the small things to the big things, your attitude, your behavior, how you respond, your faith, your strength, your courage. How you respond in those moments really sets the stage for what kind of an impact and influence you're going to have in the lives around you. Because guess what? Other people are watching. Your kids are watching. Your grandkids are watching. Your nieces, your nephews, your friends, those closest to you, they're watching. And when they watch you, it sets the stage of what kind of an impact or influence you're going to have. Because you will be a snapshot of a future generation, whether it's positive or negative. If faith is not a big thing in your life, that's going to make an impact in future generations. If you have anger issues, people are going to see it. That's going to impact future generations. Jesus not really being that important in our life, maybe on Sunday, but throughout the rest of the week, it's not really evident. That's going to play a part in future generations. If Jesus is really everything and he's your passion, man, people are going to see that and that's going to make an impact and an influence on future generations. You understand, church, this morning, whether it's positive or negative, whether it's addictions and how you treat your spouse or how you gossip or whatever the case may be, people notice and it's a snapshot of generations to come because people watch. And when hard things happen in our life, people watch and it's going to be a snapshot of generations to come. But here we are with Joseph who just got betrayed and is thrown um, as a slave. But he responds as if God is still with him. He still makes the right decisions. And he lives in a way that's still honoring to God. And so he starts to gain fair, or favor with Potiphar. And he starts to gain favor with Potiphar's wife. So much so that Potiphar's wife wants Joseph to be her man. He says, I want you to be my man. And he's like, no, I don't want to be your man because it's going to dishonor my master, your husband, as well as my God. And so he flees from that. And what ends up happening is Potiphar's wife starts to spread rumors. It says that he tried to rape her. And so then Joseph is now arrested and thrown into a dungeon. So it's bad already that he's a slave. Now he's a slave thrown into a dungeon. And as a slave in a dungeon, there's really not a lot of hope for you. No one's in a rush to get you out. No one's going to be paying anything to free you. He's in a bad place. But Joseph, even in the dungeon, kept doing the right thing. And here in Genesis, we're going to look at a verse in Genesis 39, verse 21. gives a great picture of what, where Joseph is at and, and kind of explains the stage of Joseph's life. It says this, But the Lord was with Joseph. And shewed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now, a keeper of the prison is a warden, right? Keeper of the prison is a warden and says he gained favor with the warden. Now, I would think it's safe to say that if you have a good relationship with the warden, that God's favor is probably not very heavy on your life, right? Things are not going well if you've got a, a good relationship with a prison warden. That doesn't really speak to like, is that evidence that God is really with Joseph, I mean, if I were Joseph, I'd be thinking those things. So it doesn't seem like God's there, but Joseph continued to live as if God was with him. And he continued to make decisions to honor God, even though I'm sure it felt like God had abandoned him. And it makes you wonder, where did Joseph get that kind of faith? Where did he get that kind of faith? So here we are in prison, in the dungeon, and Pharaoh, the most powerful man at the time in the world, has an issue with a couple of his servants. And he takes his servants and he throws them into the dungeon along with Joseph. And so these two servants start having these dreams. And they want an interpreter to figure out what the meaning is. And so Joseph explains and interprets the dreams for this one that's, who's a cupbearer. And he says, hey, your dream means this, is that you're going to be reinstated. And you're going to be able to go back and serve 
the Pharaoh, and he's like, man, this is great. And Joseph says, but hey, listen, do me a favor. If this happens and you go back as a servant to Pharaoh, you need to let him know that I'm here because no one knows that I'm here. And if no one does anything, I'm going to die here. So if you get reinstated there, please let him know. And the cupbearer says, yeah, that sounds great. The dream comes true. He gets reinstated. He's a servant again with Pharaoh. And the Bible tells us this, that the cupbearer completely forgot about Joseph. Two years later, two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. And he continues to have this dream, and it's bothering him, and he wants it interpreted, and it's driving him nuts. And the cupbearer hears about the situation, and then he's reminded of Joseph, how he had a dream, and Joseph interpreted the dream, and it happened, and he tells Pharaoh about Joseph. And so they go down and grab Joseph and bring this slave in front of the most powerful man in the world at the time. And he tells him the dream, and Joseph interprets the dream of Pharaoh. And he says, well, this is what it means, that there's going to be seven years of plenty. Seven years of plenty, but then it's going to be followed up with seven years of famine. And this famine is going to be worse famine you've ever seen and that you've ever experienced. As a matter of fact, if you don't do anything, it's going to wreck the economy. It's going to just destroy the city and the surrounding towns if you don't do something about it. And so Joseph, a slave, gives Pharaoh some advice. He says, this is what you need to do. What you need to do is you need to find a man who you can trust to administrate a project. And over those seven years of plenty, you need to have them build silos. And you need to start taxing people 20% of every grain and, and start storing it in those silos for seven years so that when the famine hits, you're going to have plenty stored up so that people will come to you and they're going to start buying grain off you and you're going to become very wealthy. As a matter of fact, even the surrounding towns will hear that you have stored food and they're going to come to you and they're going to buy this food off of you and that's what you need to do. You need to find someone. And all Pharaoh's scribes are writing notes down and saying, man, this is genius. This is such a great idea. And then Pharaoh says, okay, well, who are we going to put in charge? And he says, all right, Joseph, you're in charge. And everybody around him is probably like, what? You've known this guy for like 15 minutes, and he's not even from around here, and you're going to let him be in charge? And Pharaoh says, there's no one wiser in all of Egypt than Joseph. And Joseph becomes the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. And so now the seven years of plenty go and they start storing food and, and the seven years go and they store the food and then the famine starts. And they run into this first year of the famine and people are starting to come and buy grain off of them and then it gets to the second year of the famine and now the famine has stretched past Egypt into Canaan. And this is where the family of Joseph lives. And Joseph's family and brothers and father ran out of food and they had no choice but to go up to Egypt to buy food. So in Genesis chapter 42, verse 5 through 7 says this, And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their face to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren. And he knew them, he recognized them, but made himself strange unto them and spoke roughly unto them. So here Joseph is now 39 years old. It's been 22 years since he last saw his brothers. So here's this moment. Joseph's brothers come walking up. Joseph recognized them, but they don't recognize him. And they come down and they fall down before him. And as Joseph sees him, he remembers what it was like to be a 17-year-old boy that was stabbed in the back by each and every single one of those brothers. He remembers all of them laughing and cheering when he was sold to be a slave. He remembers all the years that he was stuck in a dungeon not knowing what was going to happen next, and it was a result of what they did to him. And they're all right before him. And he's the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. He remembers all these things. But he also remembers one other thing. 
He remembers something that happened when he was a kid. And so we're going to backtrack a little bit. And we're going to look back at this family tree. And we're looking at this family, right? Future family. That's the series. Let's put that lineage picture back up on the screen. So um, we know what we're looking at. So Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Esau and Jacob. So we're going to talk about Joseph's dad, Jacob, and his brother Esau, his uncle. There were twins. Esau was born first, minutes before Jacob. And so being born first, he had a lot of privileges. And so when Esau and Jacob were teenagers, um, they, were little, they were different. Esau was a huntsman. Jacob was a farmer and a great cook. And this instance, this first conflict that they had was when they were teenagers and Esau went out hunting and didn't find anything and was out all day and he came back and he was starving and Jacob, who was a great cook, was making this stew. And Esau walks in and he smells the stew. And he's like, oh my gosh, that smells so good. And he says, Jacob, you got to give me some of that because I'm about to die. You need to give me some food because I'm about to die. And Jacob, being the younger brother, is like, well, I don't get a lot of opportunities to hold something over my brother's head and try to get something from him. But now presents a great opportunity for me to do that. And so Jacob says, I tell you what, man, I'll give you some stew. If you give me your birthright, and that may not mean much to you, but a birthright means this, that whoever had the birthright, which belonged to the older brother, would mean that when the father passed away, that brother would get two to three times as much from their very wealthy dad. So that's a lot. He says, I'll give you some stew for your birthright. And so Esau, a typical teenager that's hungry, makes a really bad decision, right? Just kidding. But he makes this bad decision. And he says, man, that sounds great. I'm starving. Deal. I'll give you my birthright. Because that sounds good right now. I'll take it. Hungry teenager. Makes the deal. Loses his birthright. And so that's the first conflict they had. And then another one happens when Isaac gets really old. He comes really old. And is getting ready to pass away. He's blind. And so the brothers go before him. Um, for a blessing. And the blessing would mean this, that the blessing that's given, again, goes to the older brother, but the blessing means that you're going to take his place. You're going to have the right to be judge and leader and the decision maker for the family. That's what the blessing was going to be for. So Esau was going to get that blessing, but Jacob comes with, up with a plan with his mom, and so they decide to be sneaky to try and get the blessing. So Esau was a hairy guy, and so what they decided to do was cover himself with fur, and he went in and he lowered his voice because Isaac was old, couldn't see. And he says, it's me, Esau, I'm here for my blessing. And Isaac's confused, says, well, you don't sound like him. He says, come, come closer. And he feels him and he feels the hair. And he's like, okay, you must be Esau. And he gives Jacob the blessing. And Jacob leaves. Moments later, Esau walks in and says, dad, I'm here for my blessing. And Isaac says, I can't give you the blessing. I've already given it. And I can only give it once. Your brother Jacob has received the blessing. So now Esau was totally upset, as you can imagine. Look what his response is in Genesis chapter 7, 27, verse 41. It says this, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father at hand, then I will slay my brother Jacob says he's given my birthright and my blessing. I, I, when, my, when I'm done mourning my dad, I'm going to kill my brother. And so Jacob hears about this, and they say, you need to get out of here. You need to run. So he runs to where his uncle's from in the land there, and he lives there for 20 years, and he ends up marrying his uncle's daughters, Leah and Rachel. And when it's all said and done, he's got four women and 11 sons. And over 20 years, he becomes extremely wealthy and has tons of livestock and and family, and so much so that he had outgrown the land that they were in. And so in Genesis chapter 31, verse 3, this is what God says to Jacob. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return into the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. So after 20 years of hiding, God says, Jacob, I want you to go back to the land of your fathers. And Jacob understands this. He's saying, you want me to go back to the land of my fathers? God, you understand, that's where my brother Esau lives. 
You understand that, right? And if Esau hasn't changed at all, that means Esau is pretty upset with me still, and he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. He's going to take my wives and my kids and all my possessions. This is a bad idea. And so he shares this with all his family. His family knows about their history and, and knows, man, this is, this is not going to be a good situation. We've been hiding, and now we're going to go back. And Esau's going to be upset. And Jacob could potentially die and lose everything. But they're obedient to God, and they start heading that way. And as they get closer to the land, look what Genesis 33, verse 1 says. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. So they got this huge caravan of people, and they come and they look up, and Jacob sees Esau with 400 men men. This is not for a family reunion. And he looks and sees it, and he's scared to death. All of his family sees it, and they're scared to death. They don't know what's going to happen with this small army as they're headed that direction. Look what it says in 33 verse 1 through 2, and it says, And he, Jacob, divided the children unto Leah, unto Rachel, and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. So what did Jacob do? So he sees this, and he gets scared. He's not sure what's going to happen. So he makes a decision. He's going to make a line, and he's going to put least important first all the way to the most important. So dads, if you ever get in a situation like this, don't do that. Like, you're my favorite, you go in the back, you're not as important, you go up here, okay? That's basically what he did. He took all of the servants and their kids, and he put them towards the front of the line, because they'll be the ones, if someone's going to die, they're going to die first. So we're going to put them first, and then we're going to put Rachel and her kids, and then at the very end, or Leah and her kids, and at the very end, is going to be Rachel and Joseph. And I want you to notice this, in that passage, Joseph, out of all 11 kids, Joseph's name was the only one that was mentioned. So he puts them in order of importance, and Rachel and Joseph are in the very safest spot in the back. So in 33 verse 3, it says this, and Jacob passed over before them, meaning he's headed towards his brother, and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So here's Esau with his 400-person army, and Jacob starts making the trek up there, bowing down every once in a while as he makes his way there. And so Esau, he's still upset with Jacob, man. This is an irresistible target just to be able to get revenge and take everything, take everything. And as, as Jacob's walking out, his entire family is watching as this goes down, like what is going to happen next? Jacob stole his birthright, he stole his blessing, he robbed him blind, and now they're seeing each other for the first time. What is going to happen? Genesis 33, verse 4 through 7 says, And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the woman and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaids came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph again out of all the kids. Joseph is the only one that's mentioned. Near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. So Esau comes, and it's a celebration. And he meets all of his wives and kids, And Joseph stands in the very back and watches as all of this goes down. And watches as forgiveness is there and mercy is there and that everybody's embraced. And you've got to understand, Joseph's only one mentioned here because I believe that this had such an impact on him. That it was a snapshot. It was an impact. It was an influence that played part later on in his life. You know, Joseph would never forget this. I'm sure Jacob probably would tell and say, that was the day that Esau spared our life. Joseph, he spared your life. It was that day 
He showed grace and mercy because I deserve any punishment he would have given me. I stole his birthright and his blessing, and I ran and hid for 20 years. Whatever he would have done, I would have deserved it. But he forgave me. He could have killed me, but he spared us. And on that day, mercy was given. So now I want you to fast forward 30 years later. Here's Joseph, second most powerful man in the world. And all of his brothers who betrayed him are bowing down before him. And he has the power of life and death in his hands. And in a moment, which I'm sure was full of emotion, he decides to do something that he remembers his uncle doing for his dad and for all of his family. And in that moment, Joseph remembers that impact and influence, and he decides to do for his brothers what his uncle did for him. And eventually, Joseph tells him that I'm your brother. And Joseph forgives them and tells them what you intended for evil, God turned in to good. And so I share all that just to bring it to this one closing moment this morning. And that's this. It's, it's what your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, your siblings, the people that are around you, it's what, you, what they see you do in times of crisis that will lay the groundwork for what they will do in times of crisis. You know, they will forget a lot of things that we say, but they will never forget the things that we do, who we truly are, and what we did when running would have been easier when giving up would have been easier, when doing the right thing was difficult. They'll remember those things. So whether you're a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, a brother, a sister, whatever that may look like for you, that people look up to you and look at your life. And I just want you to ask yourself this question. What if it is you that they look to, to pattern their life after? What if it's you they look to, to pattern after how they treat their future spouse? What if it's you that they look to, to pattern their life after how committed of a follower of Jesus that they're going to be? What if it's you that they look to and how to have a strong faith and how to have courage, and how to trust in Jesus? What if it's you that they look to in how they respond to anger and hurt? What if it's you that they look to in areas of life because they're going to pattern their life after that? What if it's you that they look to in how you parent? Because all those things, you are a snapshot. And I want to challenge you with this. It's not what if they look to. They are looking. They are looking. No matter what age you are, there's people in your life. They are looking. And you are a snapshot in generations to come, whether it's positive or negative. It's happening. What kind of an impact are you having on the next generation, the next generation of followers of Christ? What groundwork are you laying? What kind of an influence are you going to have? What's that going to look like? This moment, why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes with me and give God an opportunity just to speak clearly to you. And, and I just want to ask a couple questions. If you're here this morning and you say, Nick, you know what? I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ. And maybe this morning the Holy Spirit has got a hold of your heart. And he's saying, listen, if you are a snapshot of a future generation, if you're laying the groundwork and people are looking to you, no matter what age you are, people are looking to you. 
And if you are a snapshot of a future generation and the Holy Spirit has got your heart and he's saying, man, then it's time to get some things right. And maybe for you, man, that's just saying, hey, I I need to rededicate my life. I need to take Jesus more serious. If my grandkids are going to pattern their life after me, then I want them to follow Jesus well. So that means I need to start following Jesus well. He needs to be the center of my life. And maybe there's some decisions that you need to make to get that right. Maybe for you. Maybe you're struggling with your marriage, with your kids, and you've had so much pride that you just want to do it yourself, and maybe for you it's time to seek out some help. Because how you treat your spouse and how you lead your kids is making an influence and an impact, whether it's good or bad. And maybe for you a step is to say, man, I need to to talk to somebody. I need to seek out one of the pastors here or, or a godly friend and get some help. To make some things right. My encouragement to you, man, if you can just make Jesus a priority in your life and follow him well, everything else comes into place. And maybe today you just need to make that decision. Or maybe you're here and you'd say, you know what, Nick, I've never even placed my faith in Christ. I'm not even a true follower of Jesus. There's never been a time in my life where I've placed my faith in Christ as the Son of God. I've never placed my faith in Him and what He did for me to die on a cross and pay for my sins. Man, I've never, I've got the head knowledge, but I've never made a decision to ask for His forgiveness and to follow Him completely. And with eyes closed and heads bowed and no one's looking around, I'm not going to call anybody out or anything like that, but if you're here this morning, you say, Nick, that's me. There's never been a time in my life where I've truly placed my faith in Jesus and accepted what he did for me on the cross and just say, I just want you in the center of my life. I want to follow you completely. If you're here this morning, you say, Nick, I've never made that decision. Can I just pray for you real quick? If that's you, would you slip up your hand real quick? Anybody like that here this morning that say, yes, that's me. And as a follower of Christ, my encouragement to you today is this. If you are a snapshot of a future generation, What things do you need to set right? What is God speaking to you about so that you can have an impact for generations to come? What does that look like for you? God, I pray that you'll continue to speak, lead, guide, and direct, and we're grateful for all that you're doing, Lord. Thank you for the story of Joseph and how powerful it is and seeing how much of an impact our decisions and our priorities can make in the lives of others. And I pray that as we get ready to close out this morning, that we'll allow you to continue to speak to us so that we can change.